I'll do my best. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to Greenlight Bookstore. My name is Micah and I'll be your host today. We're so thrilled to have tonight's event with Ryan Lee Wong presenting his new book, Which Side Are You On? He'll be talking with Megha Man Manjandar, so you're in for an excellent evening. Before I turn things over to them, just a few housekeeping things. Please turn off or silence all your cell phones. I said all your cell phones like we have a plethora at one person. <laughs> <laughs> you have several cell phones. Turn them all off. Um, masks are to be worn the whole evening. And signed books are for sale at the register. And if you have any Eventbrite purchases, you can pick those up there as well. Our interviewer for this evening is Megha Mandrador, author of the New York Times bestselling novel, A Burning. A 2022 Whiting Award winner, she is born and raised in Kolkata, India, and holds degrees in anthropology from Harvard and Johns Hopkins. She is the former editor-in-chief of Calibur Books and lives in New York. Megha will be speaking with our featured author, Ryan Lee Wong. Wong was born and raised in Los Angeles, lived for two years at Ancestral Heart Zen Temple, and currently lives in Brooklyn where he is the administrative director of Brooklyn Zen Center. Previously, he served as a program director for the Asian American Writers Workshop and managing director of Kuneman. He has organized ex exhibitions and written extensively on the Ameri Asian American movements of the <coughs> 1970s. He holds an MFA in fiction from Rutgers University. Which Side Are You On is Ryan's first book. How can we live with inte integrity and pleasure in this world of police brutality and racism. In this novel, an Asian American activist is challenged by his mother to face this question amidst generational change, a mother's secret, and an activist coming of age. As humorous as it is profound, this extraordinary debut is a celebration of seeking a life that is both virtuous and fun, an ode to mothering and being mothered. So you're in for something special tonight. Ryan will be reading from the book, then Mega will join him in conversation, and you'll have the chance to ask questions after that. So please join me in welcoming to the stage, Ryan and Mega. to be here at Greenlight Books. Um, I've lived in Brooklyn about a decade, and this bookstore and this room we're in has really been part of my literary education as a writer. Um, this is the podium where I saw uh, Min Jin Lee launch Pachinko. This is the podium where I saw Judgment Ward launch Sing Under Eight Sing. Um, so it's been like an MFA um, in the neighborhood. <laughs> Um, really grateful to be here. Thank you, Greenlight. Um, thank you, Mega, for being in conversation with me. For those who don't know, Mega was my editor on this novel. Um, so she knows this book better than almost anyone in the world um, and is an amazing novelist herself. So um, I'm really excited for our conversation. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, the best thing about doing this book thing so far has been. Um, to reconnect with old friends and community, and to form new friends and community. So wherever you are on that um, spectrum, I'm really excited to be with you here tonight, and um, look forward to your thoughts. Come say hi, please. Um, I'm gonna read from the opening. I spotted mom white knuckling the wheel of her Toyota Prius toward the curb. The car was new. Mom had finally broken her lifelong boycott against the Japanese colonizers because, she explained, the mileage was unbeatable, <laughs> and anyway, we had to let go of that ancestral shit sooner or later. <laughs> A massive concrete belt shaded the arrivals area at LAX. The air was hot and tasted like dust and metal. A sea of black rideshares honked and jockeyed for space while the passengers around me squinted at their phones trying to match the car dots on their screens to the cars around them in the neoliberal perversion of hailing a cab. Mom leaned out of her window, grinning and flailing an arm. Her car drifted forward, 
and the rideshare driver let loose his horn. He turned around and thrust his hand up rudely. A cold dread rose up in me. I knew it was coming. Hey, motherfucker! Mom's scream was like a gunshot, and her smile disappeared into a grimace. The man stared, frozen in an awkward pivot, out his window. Don't hug at me, she yelled. Watch where you're going. The man shook his head, almost somberly, and sped away. A few others turned to stare, Mom's voice having risen above the commotion and roar of engines, and kept staring as they realized it had come from a round-faced, middle-aged Asian woman with a sensible bob. <laughs> Mom double parked, and by the time she got out, she was wearing a big, childlike grin again. My son, she exclaimed, wrapping me in a hug. What? She stepped back and looked at me. You're embarrassed by your mother? Please. English is my second fucking language. <laughs> I mean, I muttered, your car was rolling forward. I must have been distracted by my handsome son. Mom reached out to smack my cheek with the butt of her palm that babying gesture I knew from childhood. I rolled my eyes and stepped back so that her fingers grazed my face. I slid my carry-on into the trunk, and before the traffic cop could scold us, climbed in and shut the door with a thump. The din of the arrivals area evaporated, replaced by the soft whisper of air conditioning. How's how many? I asked. Mom was silent. I could have come back sooner. I told you about the surgery, Mom countered. You said you were busy with all that organizing. I didn't remember that, but she was probably telling the truth. I usually scrolled through Twitter during our phone check-ins as Mom ran through her list of updates and Dad interrupted with the occasional joke. Yeah, well, I said, it's a critical time. I might miss the sentencing. Wow, a serious activist. <laughs> Mom and Dad talked about my activism with the same condescension other parents talked about their kids' singer-songwriter careers. Pickets in Brooklyn are no joke, I countered. We have to stomp so our toes don't go numb. It's not like protests here where people wear shorts. You're going to freeze your skinny butt off, she chuckled. I think about you whenever it's in the paper, that Chinese cop. You can tell from his face that boy's a little lost. Yeah, I said, he was probably lost in that public housing stairwell. Lost those 12 minutes he waited to phone dispatch while a Kai Gurley lay bleeding from the bullet he fired. Read, Mom's voice dropped. All that activism is making you harsh. I thought back to when I'd first seen Peter Liang in the courtroom. We all wore head-to-toe black in solidarity with a Kai Gurley's family his partner and daughter and aunt sitting silent and upright, a couple rows in front of us. The bailiff brought in Leong, and I leaned over, wanting to look the killer cop in the face. But Leong's baby cheeks and dumbfounded expression, his somber navy suit and basic East Asian haircut, only reminded me of the kids uh, I knew in high school. B minus Asians, who always liked to be behind, sold weed, and asked to copy my calculus homework. I felt, of all things, let down. Mom's car passed through the Inglewood oil fields, a wasteland of scrubby bushes dominated by a silent army of pump jacks churning up the earth. They dipped their insect heads until counterweights swung them back up. They're going like we don't have a hole the size of Antarctica in the ozone, I said. That's why I got this Prius, said Mom with pride. You know it gets 50 miles a gallon? I guess that's a band-aid solution. We idled at a red light, and Mom punched a button on her armrest. The locks clicked open. You can always walk home. I turned my head and caught a flicker in Mom's eyes. She let loose her big guttural laugh that finished in a little cough wheeze. <laughs> okay, you got me, I said. Ah. <sighs> So serious, said Mom. You're reminding me too much of myself back in the day. I love that reading. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is working. Is it? 
Testing. Okay, we'll just, just try to hold it. Yeah. Um, I love hearing you read because it's absolutely crystal clear when you read the mix of intellectual seriousness and kind of sly, sneaky fun that makes up this book. And I want to start by asking you, Ryan, how you came to the idea for this book and how you landed on this particular tonal mix. Yeah, thank you. So I um, first had the idea for this book in 2016, around the time the book is set. Um, I was watching these protests in which um, tens of thousands of Chinese Americans were marching in support of this Chinese American police officer who had killed an unarmed black man in a public housing stairwell. So this is based in real life. And at the moment, I was, um, you know, I was marching with Black Lives Matter. I was part of this like really great progressive group of young Asian Americans who were like trying to form these solidarity conversations. And all of a sudden, we looked up and realized we were completely um, outnumbered and outorganized, and didn't understand why, or at least I didn't. Um, and at the time, I had the idea for this book. I think I was a little bit more like our narrator. I was a little more unforgiving, I was a little more in my head, um, and I um, didn't know what to do with any of this. Um, and I was always a lover of fiction, I'd always had the idea I wanted to write, and so um, I felt that fiction was an area that was big enough, capacious enough emotionally to hold some of these difficult emotions and feelings and politics that were really tearing apart these communities. Um, and um, what it took me a while to do was actually to have enough distance and um, compassion from the person I was circa 2016 so that I could write um, the narrator in maybe like a teasing, funny, but also serious and compassionate way. Um, and I think that's where the voice finally clicked in. So part of what I love in this book is that we have the story of Reed, the main character, who basically goes home and has this series of conversations with his mother, who um, is clearly inspired by, by your mother. Do you want to talk about the real life kind of family inspiration that has worked its way into this book? Yeah, so um, part of the experience of like being alive for me was never really having language for my own experience. So, um, you know, I'm Asian American, but like, as we, as many of us talk about, that can mean a lot of things. Um, and my, my father is fifth generation Chinese American, my mother's an immigrant from Korea, and somehow um, this Korean immigrant woman became radicalized in the 70s and um, worked to, um, free a wrongly imprisoned Korean American man named Chol Su Lee, if you've seen that documentary recently. Um, she worked to repair black Asian relations in South Central in the 1980s. And I was, you know, growing up I never really had language for this except to explain the very basics of this. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to write this because um, the classic reason, I would never seen it before. Like, but not just that I'd never seen it before, I needed to understand for myself like the internal motions that would allow that kind of politics um, to happen. Like how is it that this person went from um, arriving in America age 15 to like four years later uh, reading Marx um, in a study group at Berkeley. Um, that, was, that was the kind of motion that I wanted to talk about with this. And what's really fun in this book is that, so Reed has these conversations with his mom, and part of what they're trying to figure out is how do you live, and I think this is a question which is so important and relevant for our lives, for everybody's life, how do you live a life which is moral and fun? How do, you, how do you combine virtue and pleasure? 
And I wonder if writing the book helped you find a way forward? Yeah, it did. In that, um, <laughs> essentially the book was, um, it was like imagining two bumper cars, Reed and his mother, colliding against each other over and over and over again. Like, that's essentially the, the motion of the book. That's the plot of the book. <laughs> Spoiler. Um, until eventually they um, settle down enough to, like, to get out of the bumper cars and, like, actually have a conversation, you know. Um, and so it's not that Reed's worldview is entirely wrong. Like, I think he makes a lot of good points. I think he's very smart. And it's not that the mother's worldview, which involves more self-care and um, uh, things like going to yoga and the Korean spa, it's not like that's completely right. It's that they have to both um, drop their ideas a little bit and actually start to talk to each other and listen to each other. Um, and I feel like that's the key. It's not a direct answer to this question of like, what's the right way to live under late capitalism? Um, the answer is a little bit like stepping outside of that question. It's also very much about how do we locate our own moral center? And that's part of what the book does so beautifully is even beyond the relationship between the main character and his mom, there are friends here who are figuring out, well, how can we be friends when our politics are taking us in different directions? Can you talk about writing these complicated friendships? Yeah. Um, so this is another thing that I found really fascinating about being in um, kind of like some of the leftist activist spaces uh, I am in and I've been in is like um, you like each other sometimes as people like you hang out you know you like talk about movies and stuff but then you also have to have this other relationship where you're talking about like structural racism and your analysis of it and like the root causes of violence and most of the time you don't click with people on both levels right um, if you're lucky you do and then most of the time, even if you do click with people on both levels, that doesn't last forever, right? So what do you do with that? And I think Reed in his head is just like, okay, if everyone just like shuts the fuck up and like gets on the same page, then we'll all like get to the revolution and like we'll be there. But um, but that hasn't like worked in my experience. So he has to like figure out a different way. Yeah. Um, I want to take a step back from the book and ask you about your life, which has brought you to writing this book. So you've worked at the Asian American Writers Workshop, you've worked at Kundiman, um, and you currently, you still work at the Zen Center, even though you, you're no longer at the Center Upstate. Can you talk about these different experiences and how they brought you to being the writer that you are? Um, people come to writing many different ways. For me, it is impossible to imagine my path to writing um, outside of community, outside of Asian American arts community, outside of Zen Buddhist community. Um, I think some people maybe like are exposed to writers at a young age or just like are so determined that they like kind of will themselves towards becoming writers early on, but you know, uh, I never knew any writer, writers growing up in LA, um, it, ne it had never occurred to me uh, until really like working at the workshop that you could have that kind of life, you know. I remember going to this like magazine launch for um, the Asian American Writers Workshop and like uh, my friend being like, hey, this is like Alexander Chi, and I was like, hi, I'm Ryan. <laughs> um, and, um, and like just meeting these working, living writers who were doing um, their things, and that really like blew my mind. So it was very, it was very simple. It was just like I had to meet those people. Um, but then, the other part about community is that I had to know that there was a group of people who might actually 
want to read this book about a young Asian American activist talking to his activist mom. That is also something I could have not imagined without community. Um, so it's not just like the permission to be a writer, but it's also the confidence and the faith that there would be at least like 75 people in the world who would read this book. Yeah. Um, and speaking of Alexander Chi, I have to slip into editor mode and say that he loved the book. And, <laughs> <laughs> and if you're, if you're um, new to Ryan's work and you haven't read the book yet, um, just take a look at all the all the blurbs on the back, <laughs> which we work very hard to get. <laughs> um, I want to. I'm I'm so curious. When we had that lunch a while ago, Ryan, we talked a little bit about your meditation practice, and I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about how that specifically intersects with your writing practice. Yeah. Um, so there's a few Brooklyn Zen folks out in the audience tonight. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. Um, I um, so the the first big thing that I realized writing and meditation, sitting zazen, have in common is you essentially um, sit there for a very long time with zero expectation of anything happening. Um, you sit there and you tie it for pages and pages and pages that you will probably throw out. Um, you sit zazen for hours and hours and hours and you just see the same thoughts over and over and over again. And you think that um, you've gotten, gotten something, you think you've like accomplished something, but um, actually nothing's happening, right? Uh, but still you need to do it because you need to become familiar with those patterns in order to have a little space from them. And still you need to write those pages and pages and pages because they helped you get to whatever sentences you end up keeping. Um, so they're both incredibly um, humbling, slow practices of patience for me. Yeah. What is sitting zazen? I don't know what that means. Oh yeah, so sorry, zazen literally means like sitting concentration and it's zen style meditation. And unlike some other like schools of meditation um, where you listen to sounds or you listen to guidance or you like walk, in zazen you're just like sitting there. It's just like you and your thoughts and you keep your eyes open so it's a blank wall and there's really like nowhere for you to go except um, to face whatever is happening. That sounds like really good practice for facing the kind of constant challenges, the constant interior challenges of writing. Um, what was most challenging for you in writing this book? Um, I think the most challenging thing was to um, have compassion for every single person in the novel. Um, I hope that happened and I hope that readers feel that way when they read it. Um, but I think part of what I was struggling with at the time, like circa 2016, was that I really felt a lot of anger towards so many sides of this conversation and conflict. And was even kind of like, I found myself turning against people who were supposedly on my side. Um, and I think if I've done my job well as a writer, um, every person, every situation, every subject position in the novel is valid um, because they're all human and they're all in their way asking for um, freedom or safety or both, even if it's in a misguided to me way of asking for more police or asking for this cop to be let off. It is ultimately, I think, coming from a place of wanting safety. Um, and that took a long time to really internalize and see enough to write about. Um, the book is also... Did it stop working? <laughs> is this working? Okay. Um, the book is also really fun. Thank you for lending me your mic. And I'm going to borrow a question that somebody else asked you recently, which 
I think is a fabulous question. How did you make this book so much fun to read? How did you make it so pacey and swift and just fun? Thank you. Um, so yeah, when talking about like really intense, heavy stuff, this is actually something that um, our Zamora Lindmark talked about at one of the Kundimon retreats. He was like my mentor. Um, and he was like, you know, a lot of people are asking me, I'm like, oh, we're writing about like intergenerational trauma and like our families and like secrets, like what do you do with all that? And he was like, make a joke, like make it light, like do something funny, like no one's making you make it heavy. Um, and he does that really amazingly in his work and um, he talks about serious historical traumas, um, but he also like gets off some really good jokes. And um, I really respected that. Um, and I also think it's true to life. So like, you know, I would be going around asking my mother about these heavy things. I actually interviewed my mother for this book. Um, or for a project. <laughs> for an unnamed project at the time. Um, and we'd be like driving around and she'd be like talking about, you know, um, her time in like South Central. And then she'd just like, um, and I'd ask her about like one of her people she was organizing with, and she'd be like, "Oh, you know, you know that guy, he ate a lot. I mean, he ate like so much." And she'd just like start talking about him as a person, and like it really lightened the mood, and humanized him. And I wanted to capture that fullness of the experience. That is, it isn't actually all just heavy. And I think anyone who's organized for any amount of time and like kept healthy has had to like find ways to make that fun too. Um, I had a two-part question for you when you were talking about your mom, but now I can only remember one part, which is for anybody in the room, writers in the room, who want to do similar work where they turn to family histories, what advice do you have for having that kind of interview slash conversation with a parent? I know I remember my second part, which is, has your mom read the book and, and what is her response? Um, uh, okay, this I, I mentioned this already, but this worked for me. It really helped to um, say I was doing it for a project um, because there's something about like doing it towards something else that actually makes it a little less intimate, um, and especially if you come from a family that values. Uh, higher education, <laughs> um, like mine does, uh, it was really helpful to be like, oh, you know, I'm doing this like research, da da da. Um, and so it, it like gave me an excuse to like pull out my iPhone and um, just like record the conversation. And that actually added a little space to the conversation. So it wasn't just like me, your son, asking you about you, my mom, your past. It was like me, uh, a young, curious researcher asking you about the work you've done um, and okay, uh, and, and so the other thing I had to do, I don't know if everyone has to do this, but for years I would literally like not talk about this book at all to my parents. My parents would be like, what are you writing about in your MFA? And I would just be silent, just like <laughs> complete silence. Um, and that was really helpful for me because I needed that space. And if I was like talking about this with my mom as it was happening, it just would not have come together as a novel. Um, she's read it, my dad's read it. Uh, there's, there's a dad character in the novel. Uh, my brother's read it, my brother's here. Um, and uh, they're all chill. They all really, yeah. <laughs> they thought it was funny. Um, to their credit, they didn't have any like edits, um, which I was shocked by. Except my mom was like, "Oh, you misspelled a couple of these like Korean words," which <laughs> I had. So um, yeah, I uh, I really do feel a lot of appreciation that they like in the end just let me get away with all of it. Yeah. I have a. Is this working? Yes. Um, I have a kind of big question for you, which I feel like I was thinking about the whole time that we were working on this book, but I 
never really had a chance to step back and ask you this big question, but for me, this is one of the most provocative and fun books of political fiction that I've worked on, that I've read, really. And I'm so curious about your thoughts on political fiction. Um, what are the most exciting things that political fiction can do? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, putting on my my lefty hat with my literary hat for a second, you know, I don't know if you all know this, but like, the CIA literally funded the Iowa Writers' Workshop for many years because they thought it presented a certain model of kind of like individualism that would represent America well abroad in opposition to um, communist literature, which was much too um, like socially focused and political, of course. So um, I think that's had actually like a profound effect on American literature, where um, if you look at a lot of the books that are published, um, politics is often kind of like on the outside or is like a joke or is um, just nowhere to be seen. It's very much about like um, domesticity, individuality, um, individual people going through like emotional changes outside of social realities. Um, and so part of writing this book has actually been having to like reconstruct my own lineage outside of that kind of dominant force in American fiction. Um, and I'm actually uh, writing an essay about this where, you know, finding someone like Grace Paley or Vivian Gornick or, um, you know, in the UK, Doris Lessing, in Italy, Natalia Ginsburg. Um, and it's not a coincidence that a lot of these people are women and a lot of them are Jewish because they often share this experience of being just enough outside of the American mainstream to see into it. And I think, um, as many of them were mothers also, who understood that politics and socialism and these very like important debates about society actually happen at home and between parents and children and between siblings and can actually like affect the fabric of family life on a daily basis. And that was really inspiring to me. Um, so, you know, in this novel, there, there is one like march, but really it's mostly about these small moments of family life and how politics enters and actually literally shapes um, the relationship between the mother and the son. I love that. You're, you're questioning the borders between, you know, so-called domestic fiction and political fiction. Um, I really love that. Um, I, have a, I have a kind of process-oriented question for you which I feel like we are far enough away from the editing process that I can ask you, mm -hmm. what was it like being edited? And what was it like having this incredibly, <laughs> you can only say good things. Um, what was it like having this incredibly intimate novel where you, know, you are talking about so, much of the, so many of the moral questions that you've been grappling with, and I think many people are grappling with. There's so much of your family in it. It's both a very public novel and a very intimate novel. And what was the editing process like? Only good things, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so I had actually read um, your novel, A Burning, before um, we had met as a writer-editor relationship. And this is relevant because um, I, like, I read that book and really respected it, and I was like, oh my god, the author of this novel is going to read every single sentence of my novel. <laughs> and it actually made me go back and like reread every single sentence, <laughs> which was great. It was like, um, that, you know, like, that moment was kind of the moment where I was like, and this is a wonderful thing, again, about having a book in the world, is that, oh, the peers and... Um, contemporaries I really respect are actually going to engage with this book. And that made it real in a way where um, I couldn't hide at all. Um, so that was really powerful. And I think um, you also understood um, 
the narrator's journey, Reed's journey, in a way where, like, you know, the suggestions you made about the um, plot line with the friends, or the plot line with the mother, um, things just kind of like clicked into place in this way where um, the way the novel ends, um, I won't spoil it, but um, you know, we changed the ending in a pretty significant way. And I knew it was a good edit because like, I actually can't really remember what it was before um, because it just didn't, it feels right now in a way that it didn't before. Um, so it was a lot of just trusting that internal sense It was, it was really such a joy working on this book. Um, Michael waved at me, which means we are opening it up for questions. Who has a question for Ryan? Yes. Do I need to project or something? I think so. Um, I haven't read the book yet, but I, I was wondering, um, in choosing to have the real life, like Peter Young story in there. Had you contemplated ever using a more fictional um, scenario, or like, you know what I mean, like the kind of fidelity? I think we talked a little bit about fidelity to the family story, how do you do research for that, but I also wonder, you know, what kind of gravity using a real life scenario like that lent to your book, or if you're contemplated using something fictional. Yeah, um, it's funny. Uh, Someone from workshop here is here, Simeon. I, I have this distinct memory of this one time, um, Simeon writing on my like workshop submission, just fiction slash nonfiction question mark, <laughs> and I was like, huh. And what that made what, what that made me do was like, it is so close to life, in a sense, that I really had to ask myself like, why write a novel at all? Um, so. On that side, I, it was very much about the form, uh, the form of the action. You know, you're not reading this book because of the information solely, um, or like the, um, you, you don't have that little kick of like knowing this was real. Um, so you're driven by the movement of the character. Um, and then in terms of like making it a little farther from myself, I tried actually and I couldn't do it. Um, I was in a conversation with Kathy Park Hong last week, and she helped me coin the term, which I'm going to use, documentary fiction. It feels like a documentary, um, but it still feels like fiction. Um, everything is drawn from life, um, and yet it has to have that emotional um, switch that I think fiction does better than any other genre. Um, you know, an earlier version of this book, uh, had scenes set in the 80s in the lead up to the LA uprising and um, have like this kind of historical fiction feel and I was writing those pages and it just felt like so false to me um, I don't think I think maybe someone else could do that book but I couldn't and I think it is because of that um, how strange in particular I've always felt my life was that I could only do it this way By Simeon, did you mean Simeon Marsalis? Yeah. Catapult author. I can't see him. <laughs> Hi, Simeon. Hi. Um, yes, more questions. Um, you talk a little bit about like the justice to each of the characters, and I'm curious how you do, like, what's that process like? Because it is difficult. Yeah, so the question was about um, how to really like make room for the characters you disagree with. Um, I think part of it was actually I had to trust my own politics enough to make room for them. So I think actually like until pretty, pretty recently, I would have been too nervous to write this book because I've been like, 
oh my god, I'm going to write something on page like 75 and someone's going to screenshot it and then like put it on Twitter and I'm just going to be like destroyed, you know. And that could still happen, but I'm like confident enough in myself that like I don't feel like I've done anything worth cancellation. Um, and I think the other one is um, really asking that question of, which I mentioned, which is like, you know, what if this most misguided character, this most misguided action was actually a misplaced request for love and safety? Um, which I do think is true. I, I genuinely believe that. Um, and to really follow that question all the way to the end. Um, and I feel like it is, um, it's a process of heartbreak because it means that um, whatever happened to this person has made it so that that question got twisted somewhere along the way um, in a way that made them cause harm. But that the, the core feeling is um, sincere. Yeah. serious question. Um, so how do you make something funny? Um, okay, something else Zach and Mark said, shout out, is um, I was like, oh, like, you know, when you're writing, you must, you must be like laughing, right? And he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> and he was like, if, if I'm like making myself laugh as I'm writing, I throw that out because he doesn't trust that feeling. Then you're pandering. Then you're just trying to get off a joke. Um, I don't, I can't exactly explain what humor is, but when it happened here, it was always, you know, humor is about surprise. Um, and uh, my experience with my IRL mom is that um, she's funniest when she's just like being herself because um, I will say something or ask something and she responds in a way I completely didn't expect and that's funny. Um, so I think if characters are being genuine and they are just kind of like naturally themselves, humor often arises because um, we're so weird. Like our personality is just so weird and unpredictable on a fundamental level that surprise will inevitably happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great questions. More? Yeah, so you, I heard you mention, I haven't read it yet, but I heard you mention this sort of how to live a virtuous life and include pleasure in that. Um, but Buddhism has sort of a, a lens on those things, a virtue and pleasure. And you were also living at a monastery with you of drafts where pleasure maybe was a different thing than in lay life. And I was just curious how that, or if that, and how that impacted sort of the way that you um, came to any kind of understandings or the worldview in this about pleasure. Yeah, so the question is like, you know, about pleasure and like Buddhism having a complicated relationship to that. Um, you know, shout out to the middle way. That's, that's the middle way. And so the middle way to me, it's not like, you know, 50% pain, 50% pleasure. The middle way is like stepping back enough to have enough distance so I'm not grasping either pleasure or pain. And like, Reed is grasping pain. Like Reed is actually, and I was this way, I've seen this a lot in like organizing spaces. It's like, if I, if I eat that pain, I'm a better person. Um, and then many of us grasp pleasure also. Like if I just like get that high, if I get that sensation, I will be happy. And so um, the, the living at the temple helped with this because um, at first, it feels very harsh and ascetic, and you're like waking up at five, and you're eating oatmeal every morning, and you're like sitting meditation for two hours a day. But then I realized, um, actually, we had everything we needed. 
<clears throat> and once I realized that, then like all of the smallest things became just like so miraculous. Like we'd, we'd have off day and I'd like crack open a seltzer and it was like, ah. <laughs> it, was like it was like I've never experienced, you, you can't have seltzer during the week. But on off day, you just like crack open the seltzer and it's like, oh my God, this is a miracle. Like there are bubbles in this can and I can open this can anytime I want and like experience this effervescent treat. And, um, and so like, the point is, the stepping back, stepping back from grasping both actually like, to me leads to this like, deeper sense of pleasure, which is to like, really feel the miraculousness of all these things that are around us. I was wondering, in in the process of writing this book that was, you know, kind of based on your life and, and your family, if you discovered anything that you didn't know about your relationship with your family or, or about your, your family's story. Yeah, so the question was, like, if I discovered anything new in the writing of this. Um, yeah, a lot. So much. It, during that, like, research project where I, like, sit down and interview my parents. I was trying to keep it cool, but I was like, oh my god, like when they were telling me. And I'm like, oh, no wonder they... So my parents had actually made the decision not to impose their politics on me and my brother growing up. Um, they really tried to give us kind of like a normative, middle class, you know, American upbringing as much as that was possible. Um, but there are always like cracks at the edges, right? But then when I actually like sat them down, I was like, oh, no wonder you didn't talk about this stuff. A lot of it's very painful. Um, a lot of it's very like radical in a way that um, I don't think I would have been prepared for at a younger age. Um, and because a lot of those politics have been so marginalized or persecuted, um, I think I actually had to have enough of an understanding of um, American society and what it's capable of in order to actually like receive those histories. Um, and you know, I wrote this book, and it is fiction, but you know, my brother read it, and my brother was like, um, so this part, did that, was that actually, <laughs> was that real, or is that, you know? Um, and uh, so the fiction is also has the effect of being a kind of mirror, uh, a mask in that way, or a screen, yeah. I think we only have time for one more question, and there's a hand in front, so I'll just say, please buy this book from Greenlight, read it. It's a fabulous, brilliant book, which will leave you thinking. Um, and we'll close with one last question here. Uh, yeah, I was hoping, uh, I was wondering if you would be able to speak to um, your father, a fifth generation Chinese American, and uh, his personal and family history that related to I guess racialization and the themes you touch upon in this book, and how that might have influenced your thinking or writing. Yeah, so the question is about my father um, and being like fifth generation Chinese American. Um, so, so what's in, what I grew up with was having kind of this interesting um, dual experience of like uh, immigrant mother and then like multi generational Chinese American family. And um, for those who don't know, the reason you don't go around meeting a lot of like sixth generation Chinese Americans is because of the Chinese Exclusion Act. 1882, which essentially barred uh, immigration, but not only that, it um, criminalized um, marriage, essentially. So you essentially had a mostly bachelor society at that time that um, was doomed to um, die out without um, forming families. Um, and so mine was one of the few families that actually um, had started before exclusion. And um, that experience is so rare and so particular because of this like very intense, particular racist law. And that's something that took me a long time to name. And so, you know, um, one of the things it's done is um, influenced the family psyche in a particular way where like there's very much this feeling of having survived something, which we did, um, which is very different from the uh, popular narrative of 
American migration, which is like how lucky we are to be here. Um, so, um, so yeah, that's there, um, and that shows up like here and there in the book. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Ryan. This book is a gift. Big hand for Ryan. <laughs>